Let's take a closer look at the history of wings today and how they got on cars. Let's start with Sir George Cayley, who was fascinated by birds and did extensive research on the secrets of flight. He came to the conclusion that the problem is so complex that it couldn't be solved theoretically, but only with extensive experiments. He built and tested different glider designs and one of the questions he had was, which is the most aerodynamic shape? To find an answer to that, he took a trout, so a quick and streamlined fish, froze it and cut it in the middle. The result of this comes already very close to modern wing profiles. But Cayley himself didn't use wing profiles for his machines. The general scientific theory at the time was based on kites. Kites are angled flat plates on a string which fly in the wind, so they are easy to be measured. So people measured the angle of the kite and the wind speed, got a resulting force which was perpendicular to the plate and could work out the numbers for lift and drag. But in this theory, the drag was very high compared to the generated lift and it resulted in a requirement of 1 horsepower per 4 kilogram. So the general theory at the time said that 1 horsepower was required to overcome the drag to keep 4 kilogram in the air. In the meantime, in Germany, Otto Lilienthal and his brother watched birds fly. They dreamed of flying themselves and started to analyze birds. They measured the weight of a stork, which was 4 kg. So based on the general theory, the stork should have 1 horsepower if he wants to be able to fly. But one horse had a weight of around 400 kg. So something was very off with this theory and the brothers started doing experiments. At the same time, they studied the stork and its wings in great detail. They could already see that a bird did not have straight wing profiles, but curved ones. Now Lilienthal built a machine to measure lift and drag of different wing sections, the so-called Rundlauf, which is similar to a helicopter today. Here he could fix one wing either side and the rotor with its two wings spun in a circle, driven by two weights at the side, similar to an old clock. The heavier the weights needed to be to spin the rotor, the higher was the drag. The rotor shaft could be lifted by the rotor itself and the weight in the center helped to work out the lift of the rotor assembly. So now he could work out lift and drag of different wing sections in different angles. First he tried straight wings, which gave lots of drag and not so much lift. Then he tested curved plates like he had seen it on birds' wings. And that was the first big breakthrough. Suddenly these wings produced so much more lift at lower drag. Lilienthal realized that a flat plate separates the flow on top and only relies on the higher pressure below. The curved surface, however, kept the upper flow attached and even if he changed the lower side to a flat profile, the lift would stay roughly the same. So that proved to him that the most of the downforce comes from the upper side with lower pressure. And now he prepared different curved profiles. First he thought that minimal thickness would result in minimal drag and so he used thin sheet metal but it wasn't stable enough and he added a small rod at leading edge and trailing edge to stabilize the wing. Then he used a thin wooden plate and glued paper on one side to camber it slightly. That resulted in thicker profiles and he realized that it didn't make a difference. So it didn't make a difference if they are thicker or thinner and if the thickest part is in the middle or at the front. They perform pretty much the same. Then he created a profile with a thick round leading edge like he had seen it on birds wings. He assumed the drag would now be higher because of the thick leading edge, but that wasn't the case. In fact, this profile had lower drag and more stable lift across a wider range of angle of attacks than all the other wings before. So the extensive work of Lilienthal explained what the previous theory couldn't explain. And that was the basis for all further wing design and with a much smaller power requirement, the current engines were powerful and light enough to build a plane. The Wright brothers undertook the first motorized flight in 1903, seven years after Lilienthal's fatal glider accident. Aircrafts were developed further rapidly and the First World War gave another development push to a reliable means of mobility. After the war, when motorized flight was prohibited in Germany, Aircraft engineers turned to cars and one of the results is the Rumpler Tropfenwagen. So cars turned into wing shapes but didn't use wings yet. 
Experiences from the war also showed that even if the trailing edge of the wing is damaged, the plane could still fly. And that means that cars could get a more usable shape and still have low drag. Because Germany wasn't allowed to design airplanes with piston engines after the First World War, engineers concentrated on designing gliders and rocket engines. The first car manufacturer to pick up on that topic was Opel. They teamed up with rocket engineer Max Valier and put 12 rockets in an Opel 4PS. It could accelerate from 30 to 75 km per hour in just 1.5 seconds, which was a bit frightening and they were a bit concerned that the car would lose road contact. Based on these experiences, they built the first car especially for rocket propulsion, the Opel Rag 1. This was based on an Opel 1040 PS and got a single-seater body. The four-cylinder drivetrain was removed and 12 rockets mounted at the back. Because the car didn't have a heavy engine and gearbox in front anymore, they mounted a wing underneath the frame behind the front wheels. That way, they wanted to make sure to stay on the ground. They chose a symmetric wing profile and an aggressive negative angle of attack to produce downforce instead of lift. Ground effect wasn't discovered yet. The car was officially presented and driven in front of a huge crowd at Opel's own test track near Frankfurt on 11th of April 1928. The car accelerated up to 140 km per hour with frightening acceleration. The presentation was a huge success and Fritz von Opel quickly decided to build a new, even stronger rocket car with 24 rockets in the back for an even bigger presentation on the Berlin Avos racetrack just six weeks later. Again, the driver sat in the back of the car with rockets behind him. The front of the car was empty. And because they wanted to reach higher speeds with this car, they put much larger rings on it to keep it on the ground. This time, they used cambered wings because it was common knowledge that they produce more load. But instead of inverting them to produce downforce instead of lift, they gave them an aggressive angle of attack. Again. And also the Rack 2 was a huge success. They finished the car just in time for the Avos presentation, showed a massive acceleration and reached with 238 km per hour a new land speed record on 23rd of May 1928. But this time Fritz von Opel himself was driving the car, because his race driver and engineer Kurt Volkart left the company after some arguments. Later in 1928, Volkart presented his own rocket car, where he would sit much further forward, which gave him better weight distribution and there was no need for wings anymore, which reduced drag. Exactly one month after the record run of the Rack 2, Opel tested the unmanned Opel Rack 3, which was driving on rails for less rolling resistance. It was a simple frame with a body with 24 rockets at the back, which was enough to reach 256 km per hour. Also here, to keep it on the track, they used adjustable wings in front and this might be the first front wing on a vehicle. But the general interest in rocket cars began to vanish. Ten years later, we could find wings on a car again at the Mercedes T80, which was designed by Ferdinand Porsche. If you want to know more about this project, check out my other video below. The T80 used inverted wings for the first time. Porsche mounted them in the middle of the car to apply downforce in the center of gravity, so there is no balance shift at high speeds. After the Second World War, wings couldn't be seen on race cars for a while until the 22-year-old Swiss race driver Michael May came to the 1000km race at the Nürburgring 1956 with a customer Porsche 550 Spyder. He thought that it would be a good idea to increase downforce on a race car for higher cornering speeds. He mounted an inverted wing above the center of gravity to avoid balance shifts at high speeds and calculated which dimensions he would need. The maximum width shouldn't exceed the car's width, so that was fixed. And so he worked out the depth he would need for the desired downforce. Because the resulting wing had a small span and was pretty deep, it wasn't very efficient because of large tip vortices. To reduce that, he mounted two large end plates either side. In the middle of the cockpit he had a lever with which he could adjust the wing by 17 degree while driving. So he put it flat on the straights and angled it in corners. The downforce was around the weight of the car at 150 km per hour. The result was that he was 4 seconds faster than the optimized works Porsche 550 Spider. 
The Porsche team wasn't happy, complained and he had to remove the wing for the race, which left him without a chance. Over 10 years later, in 1967, Jim Hall built the Chaparral 2F with a massive movable wing at the back. In 1968, at the Monaco Grand Prix, Colin Chapman used the same idea, but he knew that it's important to balance the car and so he put a front and a rear wing on the Lotus 49. Also, the F1 team started with symmetrical wings like Opel 40 years earlier, and they quickly adapted to cambered profiles and end plates. And today, wings in motorsport are standard. So, I hope you liked this little insight in history and please consider to become a B-Sport Club member for more videos like this. See you at the next one.